At the end of chapter 4 of his gospel, John tells us about some really unique timing in the healing of this boy from Capernaum. And it seems to me that one of the reasons John records this event is in order to teach us about God's unique timing when meeting our needs. So he wants us to know about his unique timing in our lives when he's meeting our needs. You know, there's an old saying, have you heard it? Timing is everything. It's so true. Um, Carol Burnett said that it was particularly true in comedy. And to that point, she said some people um, just have that gift of timing and some people don't. Uh, For example, um, have you heard that the movie Star Wars um, came out in a certain order and just wondered why it was in that order? It came out four, five, six, one, two, three. Do you know why? In charge of the sequence, Yoda was. (laughs) Not too good. I don't have the gift of timing, do I? (laughs) It's a bad joke to, to boot, so... Bad joke and timing, it's just horrible. But you know, timing is everything, isn't it? It's like when you got the quarterback throwing the pass to the wide receiver. It's all about timing. It's all about timing when the pitcher is on the mound and throws that fastball in, or when the batter is at the plate and swings at the ball. It's all about timing. It's all about timing when that rocket is taking off from the launching pad. And it's all about timing when that plane is landing on that aircraft carrier. Have you ever seen that? It's all about timing. It's all about timing when you're trying to make a deal in business. And certainly it's all about timing when you want to communicate to that special one those words, I love you. Timing is very important. And certainly it's all about timing in our text that we see today. In our text today, we have this man who has this son who is sick. And he wants so desperately for Jesus to get to him before his son passes away. And he hears that that, uh, Jesus is in Jerusalem. And he's thinking, well, he's going to go back to Galilee So he's probably going to come over here to Capernaum on the seashore because nobody in their right mind who's a Jewish leader will go through the middle of Samaria up to Galilee. They always go around and they go to the seashore. And so this man is just waiting for Jesus to come so that he can lay his hands on his son and pray for his son and heal him. Because he knows what Jesus has done. He's heard the story of how Jesus has turned water into wine in Cana of Galilee. And Jesus has created quite a stir talking to the political leaders down there in Jerusalem in the south. And he can't wait for him to come up to Capernaum. And yet, Jesus doesn't. He goes straight up through Samaria, because that's the kind of person Jesus is. And he takes time to speak to people who others considered racial inferiors. They were considered dogs in that society, like rabid dogs, not the cute little dogs that you pet at home, but but dirty little street dogs they they thought of the Samaritans as. But Jesus takes time. He talks with a woman from Samaria, and not only does he take time to talk to her, but he delays and hangs out with people that she knew and other people who knew her, this woman, with a reputation. And these people heard the words of Jesus, and as they heard the words of Jesus, they believed their lives were transformed. They came to faith in Jesus as their Lord, as their Savior, as their friend, and Jesus made a difference in their life. But it delayed him. And this man in Capernaum is still waiting for Jesus, who has this sick son. 
And he goes off 20 miles on foot through the high country to the land of Galilee, to the city of Canaan, where he can wait for Jesus. And he wants Jesus to heal his son. And he's desperate because time is running out. And Jesus comes and sees him. Now, some Bible commentators compare this royal official described here in John chapter 4 to the Roman centurion from that same city, Capernaum, who on one occasion, both described in Matthew and in Luke, who asked Jesus to heal their servant. And in those occasions, that centurion said to Jesus, just say the word and we realize that you have authority and based upon the authoritative word that you have, our person who's a servant in our family will be healed. But in this case, this royal official from Capernaum who travels to Jesus doesn't say that. He says, Jesus, please come and touch my son, heal my son, come with me to Capernaum. And it's Jesus in this case who says to this royal official, go, your son is healed. And so this man walks 20 miles back. And I'm sure he's just filled with questions. Maybe he's filled with doubts. But mostly he's on this faith walk. It's a faith against all doubt. And it's a hope of all hopes that his son will truly be healed. And when he's walking back to Capernaum through that hill country going down, back down to the Mediterranean seashore, he's met by some of his servants who brings word from home. And it's right here in the Gospel account of John that the Gospel writer almost gives a drum roll. Do you hear it in the text? He asks the question, is my son healed? And they say, yes, he's healed. And then he says, when was he healed? And then he learns from them that it was at the exact same time that Jesus had said he would be healed. And from that point on, he he got up and began to be healthy and strong and walk around. And with that, this official then goes home He sees that his son truly is well. The light goes off in his head. He believes in Jesus. Not only he trusts in Jesus, but his whole household begins to trust in Jesus. And God proves to this man through the words of Jesus that this is an activity that could have only have been something done by God because it was a very unique timing. It was no incidental occurrence. But this was an event that was issued forth from the words of Jesus. Isn't it a great story? And I think that this story encourages us to think about God's timing in our lives as well. When you think about timing in Scripture, over and over again, the Scripture talks a great deal about the significance of time You know, if you look in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, what does it say? For everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. You know that song, right? A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to reap. You know it, right? A time to laugh, a time to weep. There's a time for everything, and God is the master of time in our lives. And this theme, this theme is repeatedly highlighted in book after book of the Bible. And with so many of the highlights on the theme of time in Scripture comes this admonition for us to be sensitive to the timing of God in our life, to pay attention to how God works in the moments of our life. And let me just share with you a couple reasons that I think we should pay attention to God's timing. 
And think with me about this. First of all, I think we should be aware of God's timing so that we will grow in our trust of God. You see, John's description of the desperate father of this, uh, of this little boy is that he is a royal official. And by describing him as a royal official, John is suggesting that this man has massive money. He has immense power. And he has all the resources of privilege and class behind him. But like any power person who's faced with the fragility of their own humanity, this royal official has no power to save his own son. So this powerful person seeks a power from beyond that he suspects that Jesus just might have. And Jesus proves through the timing of this event that he is the very power of God. And he proves this in the unique timing that he uses in the healing of this official's young boy. Now, this, hour, this idea of the power of God's timing was really first introduced to me when I was a, a boy in high school myself. It was taught by this influential mentor and pastor in my life who taught about what he called the death of a dream. The death of a dream. Have any of you heard of this concept? I think it has a lot to do with timing, and I'd like to share it with you because it's, it's been influential for me. You see, when, when I was a, a boy in high school, uh, I was a sophomore in high school, and I was my class president in Bossier High School in Bossier City, Louisiana, where my dad was stationed in the military at Barksdale Air Force Base. And I figured it was my vision that I would then become president of my junior class, and then I was going to become the president of the student body my senior year. That was my goal. And in Boy Scouts, we'd been taught, you know, the importance of civic engagement. And I felt like a big part of my civic engagement in my community was through leadership in my school. And so this was kind of a vision that I developed for myself. It was my vision. And at the end of my sophomore year, my dad came home and he said that he had orders to move to Camp Smith in Iaea on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. And I was so bummed out because I wanted to stay back with my friends in Louisiana. I didn't want to go to Hawaii, but we moved. And when I moved to this new school, it was like a brand new experience for me where you know, I didn't know anybody. And at the end of my junior year, um, they were having these elections. And I thought, well, I'll go ahead and run for student body president. And this vice president candidate came up to me and he said, Steve, don't you know that nobody knows you? <laughs> Nobody's going to vote for you. You're not going to be elected president. And I said, I know. And it's okay. And you know why I could say I know and it's okay? It's because of this mentor pastor teacher of mine taught me about this death of a vision. What he teaches, and it's a concept that he finds echoes of throughout scripture, is we all have our vision of what things should be and how things should be. But God has God's vision for us. And only until we are willing to say death to my vision and let it just die, and then let God maybe resurrect something new, will we be able to truly reflect God's character in the midst of living out God's vision for us? You following me here? For me, this is such a helpful concept because I know so many people are taught this Pollyanna concept, and I know some junior high teachers and high school teachers and coaches will teach it to kids, and I just don't believe it's true. You can do anything. Because it's not true. You, you can't do anything you want to. 
You, we all don't have the gifts. We all don't have the skills. We all don't have the resources. You can't do it. I would say you can do all that God wants you to do. That's true. Because God is with you. But you can't just do anything your own selfish self wants to do. And, and when, when I can become comfortable with the death of my own vision, then God can resurrect something new. So I just ran for this little president position in our high school, and I happened to win. And I kind of was surprised because nobody knew me. <laughs> but that was kind of cool. And the thing about it was when, when, I, when I was elected for that position, even as a, at a young age, I realized hey, you know what, it's not about me. I'm just here to do that for Jesus. And it put me in a better character for doing what God wanted me to do. And that little lesson that I learned in high school has been a lesson that has stayed with me for all the years of my adult life and through various ministry experiences. Because I have seen over and over again that I'll have my visions and you'll have your visions as well. And only when we're willing to die to self and let God resurrect something new does God do something beautiful in us and through us and between us. And I think it's a lovely thing. So when we really pay attention to God's timing, it really helps us to trust God. Not only paying attention to God's timing uh, does that allow us to put trust in God? But I think paying attention to God's timing also enables us to lean on support and encouragement in loving, caring relationships with one another. In our text today, we see this man who is desperate. You know, he depends on his servants. His servants come and bring to him the message of God's work in his life. But even before this, Jesus is talking to his disciples in the little pericope right before this. And he talks about John, who was baptizing, and Jesus' disciples, who were baptizing. And they were all stressed out that everybody was baptizing and whose baptism is good. And Jesus said, it's all good, guys. It's all good. We're all doing God's work. And then he gives this image of the harvest. And he says, look, some people sow and some people reap, but I'm the Lord of the harvest. And we all play a part in doing God's work in the world, in our families, in the church, in the community. We all have gifts and resources and tools that we can use for God's purposes. And we need to lean in on one another. And when we look at God's timing and how God is working in other people's lives, then we can unite those gifts for God's purposes. And I was reminded of this in a big way a couple weeks ago when I went to meet my wife in New York City uh, when she came back from her pilgrimage hike in Spain. And when, when I met her there, we went down to the Jersey Shore for a little while where I served in a pastorate there. I called up the pastor a couple months ago and I said I was going to be coming. And he said, hey, come on, do you want to preach? Do you want to participate in a funeral that we're going to have that day? And I said, um, don't want to preach, but um, I will participate in that funeral because this was such a lovely lady that I, that I w wanted to share some things about her. And she had died, and they had delayed the funeral for actually a couple months, and it happened to be on that day. And so when I, when I got there to the church, it was so wonderful. We went to the, the funeral, and then we had a social event that, that weekend, and then we, um, we, we went to all three other services in that, that morning, actually. And... It was, it was so nice to see how God is continuing to bless things in that congregation. I remember when I went there, I've told several of you this little story, but it's very interesting when it comes to God's timing. Because when I went to that church on the Jersey Shore, um, I followed a man named Alec, who was there for 10 years. And he followed a man named Joe, who was there for 40 years. And people said to me when I came, they said, oh, you're here to replace Joe. And I thought, what about Alec? And I've been told by several people who are experts in transitional ministry that oftentimes it takes one or two years of transitional ministry for every decade of service of the previous pastor. 
And that's kind of what Alec had done in that ministry there. He had served just tilling the soil and planting the seeds. And when we got to this church, it was actually very amazing because I go back there and they think I walk on water, really. You might not think I do, but they do for some reason. And the thing that's so interesting is all I did was go around that church and I'd water and things would blossom. And we had one service and we started another worship service. And then we started another worship service. Then we started a fourth worship service. And our church just over more than doubled in size and we quadrupled in our giving. And we started this community counseling center in the church that was just amazing, that's still going on. They still want us to go back there for that anniversary. I don't know what we're going to do on that. But you know, I realized at the time, and I realize even more right now, that that wasn't about me. It's never about me. And it's never about you. It's all about God. And sometimes God delays in doing things because God has some work to do in us. He wants to prepare us for what God wants to do. Jesus sometimes delays things so that he can work his character in us and he can work his character between us so that we can live out his purposes. And it's not going to be about us. What he asks us to do is trust him to lean in in loving ways upon one another and to let him be our vision. Amen?